When journalists covered the Manchester bombing this week, did they help you better understand what happened or give terrorists the coverage they crave? The Investigators starts now. This is a CNN special report. An apparent suicide bombing at a pop concert. Police have confirmed multiple fatalities, perhaps many. You can see concert goers racing out of the arena in horror. People that are willing to go on the air with almost no information and speculate. To me, that's not responsible journalism. And Cooper Sun crime reporter Kim Bolin found herself the subject of her own story. A Crown witness revealed that the gang's leader had plotted to kill her. This is something that is important for the general public to understand, that journalists can still be threatened in Canada. I'm Diana Swain. We're the investigators. This is what we do. No one wants to give terrorists the oxygen of media attention they thrive on, but nor can terrorist acts be ignored. How to strike the balance is a challenge the news media faced again this week. Oh my God. Scenes of chaos inside an arena in the city of Manchester. The footage flashed around the world by news channels covering a horrific attack at a pop concert that killed more than 20 people and wounded dozens, many of them children. There have been uh, confirmed a number of fatalities following reports of an explosion. Journalists reporting live sifted through conflicting reports, providing hours of immediate, non-stop coverage. This was, they believe, one attacker. He had an improvised explosive device. Security experts were put on air to give their analysis. Those experts are often former law enforcement officials now working for private security companies. But when those experts suggest what could be done to prevent future attacks, are they actually in a unique conflict of interest? American journalist Jeremy Scahill thinks so. He's a co-founder of the website The Intercept with Glenn Greenwald and an international best-selling author who's covered the war on terrorism for years. So why does he think the use of so-called terrorism experts is a problem? We talked to him earlier this week. So what's wrong with networks such as this one putting terrorism experts, as they describe themselves, on the air in the aftermath of something like the Manchester bombing? I think that they can offer a very valuable perspective, particularly on military operations, but there should be transparency about where their paycheck comes from. In the U.S., we have many generals, colonels, and others who are actively on the payroll of defense corporations that are making money off of U.S. wars. And if they're on CNN or any of the networks, and they're advocating for a particular military strategy that will benefit their corporations, that's extremely problematic, and I think it's very unethical. So then let's move it to the, the more recent case, which is the Manchester bombing. So is there any issue then in calling on these people for their expertise, maybe their analysis of what they see, because they're not calling for necessary military intervention, but rather reacting to what all of us are seeing. Right. I would put them into a slightly uh, different category, uh, the people that are non-military terrorism experts. There are some perfectly legitimate, smart people that have a background in foreign service or they've worked in aid or the private sector internationally. They know the places they're talking about or they are scholars who have studied a particular sect of Islam or a particular country that we're talking about. The problem is, particularly in the case of things like the Manchester uh, attack, and it's horrifying, uh, you know, to, to, to attack a crowd full of children is, is just heinous. Um, but if you step away from, from the particulars of what was the bomb made of and which part of, was it Al-Qaeda, was it ISIS, was it some other faction, and you look at the way that it's covered, it's almost like, I don't know if this is a thing in, in Canada, but when I was growing up, that we had these things called sea monkeys. You pour this powder into water, right. and then you have like these instant creatures that are sort of alive. I feel like that's what a lot of our expertise uh, actually amounts to in the immediate aftermath of these things. It's, it's the people that are willing to go on the air with almost no information and speculate. To me, that's not responsible journalism. And, and I think that it's problematic uh, when news outlets run with a preconceived notion uh, that these people are necessarily Muslims, that ISIS is going to claim responsibility, or that there is a such thing as ISIS as it appears in the nightmare of Western uh, societies today. ISIS in many ways is more like a franchise opportunity. Uh, I think there is a structure in places like Syria and Iraq where they have a command structure. But in general, many of these so-called lone wolf attacks, these are people who for individual reasons have been falling in life and they were caught by their particular interpretation of Islam and it's given them their life meaning in death. 
And I think that we have to spend a lot more time analyzing why these things are happening than just reacting every time they happen. Because I do think there's a way that we could responsibly report on this as journalists that would encourage a much more meaningful debate that we should be having in a democratic society about where these attacks and the motivations for these attacks are coming from. So in your view, they have to declare, first of all, who they work for now, not just their, their private background in Look, terms of whether they have military background and if they're being paid to be a commentator now. It's almost like a legitimized form of corruption when television networks invite private sector people on to advocate for their product without ever having to tell the viewer that that's what they're doing. And on top of that saying, general so-and-so, colonel so-and-so, it gives them this gravitas. When in reality, what they're primarily doing is functioning as a salesperson for their product or an advocate for their product that's gonna make them money with a little bit of analysis drizzled over it. But that analysis is going to be consistent with whatever is gonna make the money uh, for their product in US or international wars. It's an interesting take, thank you. Thank you. Police are responding to reports of an explosion outside an Ariana Grande concert. As word of a possible terrorist attack makes it into newsrooms, journalists are faced with instant questions about how to report it. Other reports conflicting say it may have been part of the show. Perhaps From deciding what to show and what not to show. It was just screaming and crying and pushing. To determining the reliability of eyewitness accounts being posted on social media. To figuring out how to handle a statement from extremist groups like ISIS. They uh, say that they uh, were responsible for an attack. Jack Nagler is the CBC's Director of Journalistic Public Accountability. So where does he see the line between informing an audience and giving terrorists the very kind of profile they hope they get? So Jack, let's start with the pictures. That's mm -hmm. what people really absorb when they're watching television. <clears throat> Where's the line between showing people the reality the horror of what took place, not sanitizing it, and yet not going too far. Yeah, it's a really difficult balancing act because, of course, the first task is to tell people what's happening. And pictures are a huge critical part of that, especially in television and digital platforms. Uh, but you have to make sure that you're not going too far. You don't want to show uh, images that are so graphic and gory that it exploits the situation or that it disrespects the dignity of the people involved. Uh, and so you're constantly kind of weighing that question, is it necessary to use this image to tell the nature of the story? And if it isn't, you have to think really, really hard about whether you're going to use it. Let's talk about a statement from ISIS, as, mm -hmm. as everybody received in this case, where the last line in particular warns of another kind of an attack. No detail, nothing other than just a threat. Do you report it? Does that play into their hands? Does not reporting it rob people of vital information? Well, you're trying to tell the whole story, and you're mindful of the fact that you're not here to serve anybody's agenda. So as much as you can, you want to resist uh, doing what ISIS wants you to do for that sake. Uh, but you do need to tell people what's going on. So when a statement like that first comes out, uh, chances are you're going to report as much of it as you possibly can and, and give people the information that's there. Then you might be able to pause and take a breath and say, okay, what's really going on here? And you can be more thoughtful about what you're going to include and what you're not going to include. How do we validate as news organizations the wall-to-wall -wall coverage? Because it's not about mass numbers. There were more children who died in the Mediterranean this week than mm -hmm. people died in Manchester. So. What is the sort of rationale for going wall-to-wall -wall with stories like these? Well, there are so many different factors that go into it, and, and a lot of them are really practical. Sometimes it's uh, where do we have reporters? Sometimes it's, uh, you know, what is the nature of the event and, and how much does it uh, relate to our lives here in Canada? So in England, you had uh, a place where it was a concert that a lot of Canadians could easily have seen themselves at or their children at. You can relate to it. Uh, yeah, and and you know that that's not at all a kind of value judgment on on all kinds of tragedies all around the world. I, I only wish we could give the airtime and the the attention to every single one of them. But uh, this was an immediate thing, and it was something that that uh, felt like it could just as easily have happened here uh, as happened there. One of the biggest criticisms that the media at large faces whenever we cover a story like this is that we've played into the hands of those who wanted the coverage, the mm -hmm. terrorists. How do you answer to that? Well, our job isn't to, uh, our job isn't to uh, push forward anybody's agenda. Our job is to give people information about what's happening in the world, no matter how ugly or beautiful it is, and give them the information, the details, and the context to allow them to draw their own conclusions about what the nature is of that event. 
So, you know, you don't like to be manipulated. We're really careful to, to uh, pause and uh, take measures when ISIS releases videos, for example, and it's very rare that we would show the entirety of that video. We describe what they say. Uh, but we're not going to give them this free platform. We don't want them to be sending hidden messages to supporters, all of those kinds of things. Right. Uh, but it, at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's a subjective call, and you make your best judgment. And, you know, we'd all prefer to make them far less often than we have to. No kidding. No kidding. Thanks, Jack. My pleasure. A journalist facing death threats for her investigation into drug gangs. Sounds like it could be Mexico, but this is British Columbia. Mr. C did at least two scouting missions to my house, to my neighborhood. They did talk about killing me. The reporter, what she found, and the threats she faced. Next. And later. Seth Rich yeah. was shot in the back and murdered. Mm -hmm. right. He was a DNC staffer. This be could become one of the biggest scandals in American history. So how did this conspiracy theory go mainstream? But first. When did CNN become the equivalent of a five-year-old with potty mouth? Media, he says it's total bullshit. BS, excuse me, I mean, total BS. Pardon me, I did not mean it for that to come out. A slip of the tongue is an always present risk in TV, as proved by CNN morning anchor Chris Cuomo, who was caught this week with a live mic discussing whether the Pope had swatted away Donald Trump's hand. Pope did not swat the hand away, bullshit. But CNN analyst Farid Zakaria sounded like a kid who's just learned a bad word and can't wait to work it into every sentence. He has spent his whole life bullshit. He has succeeded by bullshit. He has gotten the presidency by bullshit. It's very hard to tell somebody at that point that bullshit doesn't work because look at the results, right? Not to be outdone, Anderson Cooper reached for a colorful metaphor while interviewing Trump supporter Jeffrey Lord. He's the president of the United States. If right. he wants to say that, Barack Obama wants to say whatever. If George Bush says, I looked in his if eyes he took and a dump he on his desk, you would defend it. Say it. <laughs> what? Even speechwriter John Lovett got in on the act by criticizing some of the people CNN has put on its political panels. Smart person, smart person, smart person. Bull doesn't right. help you do it. All this as CNN learns it's been beat by MSNBC in the ratings for the first time ever. So I guess we'll forgive them. They've had a crappy week. Here are five things we learned this week from investigative journalists. Canadians lost almost $13 million last year to con artists located outside the country. CBC's Go Public looked into the problem after hearing from a 90-year-old BC man who was conned out of more than $200,000 by scammers in India. New data collected by Toronto's municipal government shows on average, homeless people in Canada's largest city are dying at a rate of more than two per week. The city began recording all homeless deaths after a Toronto Star investigation found most Ontario municipalities don't track them fully, if at all. Some of Canada's leading historians told CBC News the federal government is putting the country's historical record at risk by hoarding piles of documents instead of turning them over to Library and Archives Canada. The Privy Council office says transferring such documents is time-consuming and complicated by the need to protect classified information. An investigation by the Associated Press found the World Health Organization spent $200 million on travel for its employees in 2016. That's far more than what it spent combating diseases like AIDS and malaria. And the Washington Post and CNN reported President Donald Trump asked two top U.S. intelligence chiefs to publicly deny any connection between his campaign and Russia. The White House has declined to comment on the details of the story. Journalists are often targeted by people who don't want anyone to know what they're up to. Just this month, a journalist was killed in Russia. But this week, we learned of a plot to kill a Canadian journalist right here at home. Kim Bolin is a reporter with the Vancouver Sun. She's covered gang wars in BC's Lower Mainland for years, documenting the violence that's claimed dozens of lives. These street gangs are fighting proxy wars. That's the way you have to look at it. For larger organized crime syndicates that were, you know, essentially at war for each other. We were, we were foot soldiers. A battle over turf that law enforcement officials have been scrambling to try and stop. Bolin's most recently been covering the murder trial of a member of the notorious United Nations gang, and what she's heard is chilling. A former gang member turned crown witness describing in detail a plot to kill her. A plan hatched by a senior member of the gang who's now a fugitive. 
shocking details that Bolin had kept out of her reporting until this week when she wrote about it in the Vancouver Sun. So why did she decide to take those details public now? So Kim, you had been told that you would hear information about a plot. Then as you're sitting in the courtroom, you realize it's about you. What was it like to hear that? Well, it was obviously quite disturbing. It's not directly related to the evidence in the murder case, but this witness who has done many things himself while he was in the United Nations gang was sort of disclosing his criminal past. And uh, as a result, uh, he laid out details of this plot to kill me that uh, was apparently underway back in 2011. Why did they want to silence you? Well, they said they didn't like what I was exposing about their gang. They felt that I was giving intel, if you will, to their rivals. Uh, I also have this blog where I post my news stories from the paper and I allow people to come and comment. And what was happening, some of it, you know, beyond my knowledge, was rival gangsters were going on there and anonymously kind of calling out others or posting information to throw police off. So it was quite a fascinating glimpse journalistically into what was going on at the time. But obviously, I didn't like hearing the details about the efforts they made to come after me. And, and give us some of that detail. What did you learn about what they had in mind and, and the efforts that they were taking to figure out your comings and goings? Well, uh, the United Nations gang leader at the time, Connor DeMonte, he's the man who's now a fugitive, uh, apparently got a hold of my land title so he knew where I lived. He passed that along to this witness, who I can only call Mr. C, because there is a ban on his name. And Mr. C did at least two scouting missions to my house, to my neighborhood, uh, went up and down my street, my alley. Um, and, you know, he didn't really say what they were going to do, except that they did talk about killing me and that their idea was if they were to do that, they should do it uh, during the Surrey 6 trial. And, of course, that trial uh, was of members of the rival Red Scorpion gang. So their thought was if they did it at that point in time, maybe the Red Scorpions would be blamed for the murder. You had known about this for a little while, hadn't worked it into your daily reporting of this trial. Why did you decide to, to reveal this, I guess, this week? Because no one else, journalistically, was in the courtroom when this came out. No, that's right. I mean, there were sheriffs, there were prosecutors. Uh, you know, we had some chats about it at the breaks, that's for sure, because I guess they understood that it was quite troubling for me to be sitting there hearing that. But, you know, after talking to my editors, uh, we realized that this is something that is important for the general public to understand, that journalists can still be threatened in Canada uh, for the work that they're doing. Uh, so we figured out the best way to do that. And it ended up being me writing this first person piece, which I don't normally do, but you know, um, I'm glad that I did it. I've had very positive feedback from the general public. Why is it important, you believe, for people to understand that journalists in this country can be intimidated, can feel threatened? Well, I think that we as Canadians, you know, appreciate the fact that we live in a peaceful country, you know, that uh, we have these democratic institutions that we don't think are threatened. And yet, you know, there is this undercurrent, there is this underworld, you know, where journalists, it's happened before. We had Michelle Auger covering the Hells Angels in Quebec, mm -hmm. who was actually shot. We had Tara Singh Hare, uh, who was uh, a Punjabi journalist here in the Lower Mainland, uh, you know, who wrote about the Air India bombing suspects and ended up being assassinated. So it can happen here and sometimes I think we need to remind the general public uh, that that's a possibility. Kim, thanks for talking about it. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Very strange story now. Uh, this young man who worked for the Democratic National Committee who apparently was assassinated at four in the morning. How one man's murder became fodder for conspiracy theorists and a popular American cable show. It's so much more than fake news. My POV plus Ask Me Anything, up next. Every week we invite you to essentially sit in this chair and ask me a question about investigative journalism. This week we got a question from Lynette. She wants to know, when has the truth of a story affected your personal opinions on an issue? My answer would have to be virtually every time. One of the joys of being a journalist is that no two days are the same. Every day you're covering different stories. Even if it's an issue you've covered in the past, there's something new about it that's got your attention this time. Now, the job of a journalist is to present what we've learned about something, not to share our opinions, but inevitably they're affected. You either change your mind about something you believed in the past or it reinforces it. 
If you haven't learned something new in the course of doing a story, then you're doing it wrong. So I would have to say my personal views are affected all the time, and I hope I'm sharing information with you that maybe influences what you think, too. Thanks for the question. And here's how you can ask me anything. Email us, investigators at cbc.ca, or just reach out to me on Twitter at Swain Diana. One of the saddest aspects to the Manchester bombing this week was the age of the targets. Imagine, then, being a parent of one of those killed and finding a conspiracy theory on the Internet that the whole thing was a hoax. The parents whose children were killed in a school shooting in Sandy Hook four years ago lived that online nightmare, too. Conspiracy theories like Pizzagate, which suggested Hillary Clinton was involved in a pedophile ring at this pizza restaurant, have long thrived in the dark corners of the Internet. But they seem to have moved into the white-hot light of prime time. Also tonight, another massive breaking news story. Explosive developments in the mysterious murder of former DNC staffer Seth Rich. Sean Hannity is now Fox TV's biggest name, and he's convinced the Democratic Party is behind the murder last year in Washington of party staffer Seth Rich. There's no evidence of that. Most media outlets wouldn't touch it. And Fox News took the story off its own website this week, admitting it didn't pass the smell test. Find the murderer of our son. Even Rich's grieving parents publicly pleaded with Hannity, who's a former advisor to Trump, to stop using their son's death to whip up anger against Democrats. Out of respect for the family's wishes for now, I am not discussing this matter at this time. You could just dismiss this as fake news, but it's more than that. It's dangerous and it's cruel. And it shouldn't fall on grieving parents to push back against conspiracy theorists with a political agenda. But this week, that's exactly what it took. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators.